how can I describe the Babish cookware line? Robust, beautiful, durable, practical, dishwasher safe, most, mostly. I wouldn't put the knives through the dishwasher, but the everything, I, I, so the bowls and the, um, for the first phase of the Babish cookware line, we're starting with prep tools, measuring cups and spoons, the official Babish tiny whisk, the Babish tong two pack, the three-piece stainless steel knife set with knife roll. The six and a half inch Santoku knife. The seven, ugh. The seven and a half inch clef knife, as we like to call it. The eight inch chef knife. And the three-piece stainless steel bowl set. The Babish cookware line. The, the basics made better. Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back to Binging with Babish, where this week, as you may have just seen, my cookware line is available now. Among the items available are these knives, which are super duper sharp, which I was reminded of as I was cleaning them for this very shot. And since today we're recreating the chef's platter from Monster Hunter World, it seemed appropriate to recreate a very, very old video of mine where I test out a knife's sharpness on a pineapple. Nice. I can tell that I've definitely gotten a lot older since that video, because, you know. Naturally. We have to try to f up a pineapple. <laughs> yep, that's right. I had hair. Anyway, the Babbage knives are available now. Let's get back to cooking. First, for whatever drink is being drunk out of the flagon, I'm going to make some tipache. We're going to start by roughly cubing a whole pineapple. Try to add six ounces of brown sugar. Promptly drop it. Take a moment for contemplation and self-reflection. Dust yourself off. Add the sugar plus three or four cinnamon sticks. A whole dried ancho chili if you want a little heat. One whole star anise and two whole cloves. We're doing this in a thoroughly sanitized food grade bucket because we are fermenting this mixture. Just cover it up and let it sit out at room temperature for 48 hours. The resultant mixture will be slightly darker brown. We're going to strain out all the solids and transfer, albeit unsuccessfully, to a pitcher for easy pouring. Go ahead and wipe yourself off, bust out your favorite ladle, and ladle into the pitcher. And what results is an absolutely delicious, barely carbonated, barely alcoholic, refreshing warm weather beverage. Now that that's made, we got to talk about all those meats on skewers. Now, both because the chef's choice platter changes every time and because it's called the chef's choice platter, I'm just going to kind of make whatever I want here. So for the sausagey looking things, I'm going to make a smoked sausage that's 80% lean beef and 20% pork fat, which will hopefully give us the great flavor of pork with the also great flavor of beef. We're placing both the meat and the fat in the freezer for at least 20 minutes until the edges of the pieces of meat become firm. Then through a similarly chilled meat grinder, we're grinding everything together through its coarsest plate. Once that's done, we're spreading it out evenly on a rim baking sheet, putting it and the grinder back in the freezer for another 20 minutes and regrinding this time through the finest plate. This should give our sausage a nice, smooth, hot dog-like interior. Then for the cure, I'm using the cure calculator over at meatsandsausages.com, so exactly 3.5 grams of prog powder number 1, 28 grams of kosher salt, 5.5 grams of freshly ground black pepper, 6 grams garlic powder, 2 grams of ground fennel, 3 grams harissa, and 2.5 and grams Aleppo pepper, for roughly 3 pounds total ground meat. For a spice blend that I'm gonna call babish worst you know, like bratwurst, but with babish, that it doesn't really work, does it? Sprinkle that evenly over the ground meat and massage in, making sure the cure is evenly incorporated. Of course, we're going to cut ourselves off a piece, cook it up, and test it for seasoning. We are about to turn this meat into sausages, and this is your last chance to add any more salt, pepper, garlic, whatever. It passed the taste test, so now it's time to stuff it into some intestine. Thread that onto your sausage stuffer, according to manufacturer's specifications, and stuff the meat mixture, now called a farce, into the awaiting hopper. The goal here of course, is to stuff the sausage evenly and gradually so that we don't end up with a burst sausage. Once stuffed, we can twist into individual links and then it's ready to cure. So these guys are headed into the fridge covered overnight. This is going to allow the pink curing salt to work its magic. The next day, we're going to retrieve our sausages, which are nearly ready to be smoked. First, we got to prick them up a little bit. Using the very sharpest and thinnest thing you can find, poke a bunch of holes in the links. This will prevent them from bursting as we smoke them for two hours at 200 degrees 
degrees Fahrenheit, or until they are an enchanting cherry red, juicy and fully cooked. And I was pleased to find that these sausages were pleasurable to eat, and am sure that they'll be even better once they are kissed by the grill. Next up in the world of things that we have to do way ahead of time, we're dry brining a big old chicken. Combining one teaspoon of kosher salt, a quarter teaspoon of baking powder, and a half teaspoon of freshly ground black pepper per pound of chicken. Tiny whisk until homogenous, and then use to season the bird liberally inside and out. Then this guy's headed onto a wire rack set in a rim baking sheet and being fridged uncovered overnight, which as you can see has dried out the skin, which is going to give us a really crispy bird. Now recently I've had success with the upside down roasting method, so I'm going to fill a large saute pan with mirepoix, stuff the bird full of all kinds of garlic and herbs and lemons, truss the legs shut, this helps elevate the thighs so they cook more evenly, and it's headed into the pan, inverted. And then it's headed into a 425 degree Fahrenheit oven, or 400 with convection, which if you've got it you should do, because it's going to give your bird crispier skin, flip after 30 minutes, and roast for an additional 30 until it's deeply golden brown and cooked through. Now as for the big paella looking thing in front, paella is normally flat because it cooks right in the pan, so the idea of pan transference gave me an idea. I could finish the paella in a hot pan, but this sort of reminded me of bibimbap. So again, since this is the chef's choice, I decided to merge the two. I'm making a real simple shrimp stock here using shrimp shells and a whole bunch of aromatics and herbs and peppercorns and garlic and all the things that are good, and cook it for about 45 minutes until it's really shrimpy, strain it, making sure you turn off the stove, Andy, safety first. That's what I always say, safety first, shrimp second, and keep it warm in a medium saucepan along with two cups of dry white wine. Then in a large Dutch oven, we are thoroughly sauteing one large onion, thinly sliced, until starting to caramelize. And then we're going to add two grated cloves of garlic, two teaspoons gochugaru, and one tablespoon sweet paprika, which we're just going to saute together for about 30 seconds until fragrant, deglazing with a 14 ounce can of whole plum tomatoes, and about a third of a cup of gochujang. Cook all these guys together for about five minutes, let their flavors get to know each other, and then we're adding the rice. Four cups of short grain arborio rice. Mix those guys on up together just to coat all the granules of rice, and then we're going to add our shrimp stock and wine mixture. All at once. We're not making risotto here, we're making a uh, paella bibimbap. Pipe and bop. Mix everybody together just to make sure that everything is evenly distributed. Season generously with kosher salt and freshly ground black pepper. And what the hell, let's finish things up with a couple teaspoons of toasted sesame oil. Then this guy's headed into a preheated 375 degree Fahrenheit oven for about 15 minutes. Just enough time for the rice to have absorbed most of the water so that it can act as a platform for some big old prawns. Head on, full antenna, all that good stuff. Then the lid's headed back on and back into the oven for another 15 to 20 minutes until the prawns are cooked through. Meanwhile, I'm preheating and generously oiling a large ovular cast iron skillet, which once smoking hot will be the recipient of our pie bim bop. This will hopefully create the crispy, crunchy layer that exists on the bottom of both paella and bibimbap. Or at least theoretically, like everything else that we're doing today. Pile it high and proud, arrange the prawns on top, and then it's time to start talking skewered meats. One of the more memorable parts of the chef's choice platter are some towering skewers of meat reminiscent of a churrascaria. And again, since I'm doing pretty much whatever I want, I'm going to start with a mojo marinade for the shrimp. The juice of three oranges and five limes, and a whole head of garlic, peeled and crushed. And we're also going to add one teaspoon of ground cumin, half a teaspoon of oregano, a tablespoon of salt, a teaspoon of freshly ground black pepper, tiny whisk completely until you remember that you forgot a tablespoon of olive oil, and that you wanted to experiment with baking soda, which should both make our marinade into a bubbly fizzing science project and hopefully give our shrimp some better color on the grill. Then I've got a pound of peeled and deveined shrimp here that I'm going to mix together and allow to sit in the marinade for at least 30 minutes. And now, since I'm in the mood to go to a churrascaria, I'm going to make some picanha, which actually refers to a specific cut of beef. It's a rump steak with a thick cap of fat that we need to slice across the grain to keep it tender. First we're going to start by scoring the fat, which is going to help make it look pretty. And then after locating the direction of the grain, we're going to slice across it into big old thick slabs. Mine has a little bit too much fat cap on it, so I'm going to cut some off. And traditionally these would be cut a lot thicker, but the idea is that you press it into a horseshoe shape before skewering. And speaking of skewers, I got these big boys off Amazon. These are the kinds used in Brazilian steakhouses, and I assume chef combat. Go ahead and practice your moves a little bit, take stock of the damage you just did to your table, and start skewering the beef. Now the reason you traditionally want to do these thicker is so that you can carve them right off the skewer, but for my purposes today, these ought to do just fine. Picanha is then usually heavily salted with rock salt, but all I've got is kosher, so that's what I'm going to do. Season generously and let stand at room temperature for at least 45 minutes before cooking, during which time we can subdivide our sausage into skewer appropriate sizes. And once that's done, we can similarly impale our shrimp. Once everybody has been skewered, 
it's time to head out to the grill, which we've had preheating on maximum flame for like 15 minutes. I'm going to start with the red meat because it needs the most time to cook, grill covered for maybe 5 minutes, and then rotate about 30 degrees so you get those nice cross hatches when you flip. Once flipped, shrimp cook pretty quickly and we're just charring the sausage so those guys can go on. Both are only going to need about 2-3 to three minutes per side. Once everybody's grilled up, we've only got one more dish to contend with, that sort of seafood looking stew in the corner. I have no idea what it is other than it's red and it's got seafood, so I'm going to make Thai curry mussels. So I'm saying a minced shallot and a tablespoon of vegetable oil for about 3 minutes, grating in 2 teaspoons of fresh lemongrass and 1 tablespoon of fresh ginger, so I'm saying for about 30 seconds or until nice and fragrant. Then we're adding 1 tablespoon each tomato paste and red Thai chili paste. We likewise just want to saute these guys together for about a minute just to caramelize them. Then we're deglazing with a third of a cup of dry white wine, simmering until the alcohol cooks off and adding a 14 ounce can of unsweetened sweetened coconut milk. I'm also going to add a teaspoon of fish sauce for a flavorful kick. Mix this guy up together, bring him to a simmer, and then I'm going to add two pounds of cleaned, debearded mussels. Toss around a coat, cover it up, and cook over low heat for about five minutes until the mussels open. And now all there is left to do is assemble. First we got to cut the chunk off the side of a pineapple so it can act as our skewer holder. Arrange things as closely as you can to the way that they're presented in the game. Serve up the red Thai chili mussels. Skewer the skewers, grab a gigantic wedge of cheese, and then again since our paella is inspired by bibimbap, I'm going to add a fried egg on top, scatter some scallions, and pile on some kimchi. And there you have it, my chef's choice special. Biggest challenge now is to decide what to try first. Gotta say, the best thing on the table probably ended up being the pie bimbap. It was seafoody and spicy, and it had a lovely crunchy layer on the bottom just like I wanted. I know it's an absolute culinary mishmash, but hey, tastes good. The chicken browned weird, but tasted delicious and was ultra crispy. The mini picanha was cooked to a perfect medium rare, and was pretty much just steak with salt on it, so it was delicious. No big surprises there. The shrimp was absolutely delicious, and the real problem child turned out to be the sausage, which was really tasty, but ended up getting a little dry on the grill. I suspect that emulsifying it with ice water like a hot dog would fix this. And the mussels were very delicious. A little spicy, a little cocoa nutty, and most of all muscly. And as for the giant block of Swiss, I could not resist just taking a big old bite. Thank you guys very much for watching and for making my lunch leftovers really, really cool this week.